We hope you enjoy listening to this weekly podcast from Lifeline Church. Find out more by visiting lifelinechurch.co.uk. Well, um, I wanted to share with you on a particular message that's kind of been on my mind for a little while now. Um, it's called, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child, which is like a famous African proverb. So if you look it up on the internet, everyone seems to attribute it to Hillary, Hillary Clinton, but I don't think she gets to claim that one. Um, I don't know if you're like me, you look over family holiday pictures and you just have all these smiling pictures of your kids playing in certain ways. And recently I've been taking pictures or filming certain things thinking, it's amazing which things I choose to film and which things I choose to take the photos of. Because if you had a fair representation of the holiday, you would have a lot of screaming children, crying, hitting each other. I never record those and save those ones. But um, I want to talk not just to parents today, I want to talk to the whole village. And There is a part of this message which is particularly designed for parents, but there's another part of the message that's particularly designed to the wider community. Because we're all part of the village, we've all got got a role, and as a parent, I want to raise well-mannered kids. I want kids that contribute to society. I want them to be able to enjoy their lives, and I want to shield them from suffering as much as possible. I think that's probably pretty much every parent. I, but most of all, I want them to know God. And more than just this, I want them to enjoy knowing God and enjoy being known by God. Rachel Turner, who we've often um, talked about and, and a lot of her books have influenced us, she talks about more than God's smart kids, we want to raise God-connected kids. I want there to be an outcome for my kids that they have a genuine friendship between them and God. And I don't want to settle for just mere agreeable behavior. I don't want them just singing on a Sunday and attending the, the, the children's program. I want them to know God and be moved by that reality. And I'm pretty confident that's God's attitude to my kids and to all of our kids. Because he loves our kids. He talks about... Before Jeremiah was born, he knew him in his womb, in his mother's womb. That every single day of our lives had been ordained and they'd been written in the book. And to God, it's a page turner. He loves it. Even Jesus himself said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. His attitude is towards our kids as ours as we would want our kids to be towards him. In Rachel Turner's book, It Takes a Church to Raise a Parent, she uh, shares this diagram for us. So at the center of everything, we want God-connected children. And we recognize that the parents have a key divine critical role in that. I kind of want to talk about a little bit more about what is the extended friends and family role And how does that relate to the church as well? Because to help our children come into relationship with him, he places them inside a family. And he places that family inside a church. And so I want to unpack these roles a little bit. Now, the parent's role, there's two key aspects to it. So there's the teaching aspect. There's lots in the Bible that talk about the teaching role of parents. Proverbs 1, 8, listen, my son, your fa- uh, to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teaching. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, impress these things upon your children. Talk about them when you sit, sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. And even when we see Paul talking to Timothy, you can even see a cascading of faith. And that is something that we could expect that as we are doing what is right before God, as we are loving, we are teaching just by the way that we live. 
And we have a role to model, to demonstrate the characteristics of God. I was remembering when I tried to buy goldfish to give to one of the young people before they went away to university. And I remember the guy selling the fish quizzed me about how I was going to care for this fish, what I was going to feed it, where I was going to put it, which made me think maybe I shouldn't just serve it in a wine glass, which was what my idea was. Um, and in the end, he wouldn't sell me a fish. No one ever asked me the same about questions before I came, became a father. But I trust that God places children in the families that they are. No child is an accident, and no parent is an accident. You are the best person to parent your child. But it doesn't mean that you've got it all together and it's, you're the finished product. We need lots of support. And as we experience God for ourselves, it shapes us into being a better parent. So we have that privilege of showing what he's like, his gentleness, his patience, his kindness, his faithfulness. Thank God my child's relationship does not just depend on how well I show what he's like. Because at 4.45 in the morning, which is the time that one of my sons has chosen to start waking up, I'm not the most patient. I'm not the most gentle. And I'm definitely not very generous at that kind of time. But the reality is, I can hold a real hope that as I see God, I am being transformed into his likeness. And there is something that's going on as I yield to him that is going to break through all those weaknesses. And I will be able to show some of his character to my children. And my children will benefit from that. Because God can use all things for good, even times when I've messed up. I have an opportunity to demonstrate humility and ask for forgiveness. I can demonstrate how we get back on the horse after we've made a mistake and not live in shame. And by the grace of God, I've got the power to live according to his will. But there's no replacement for that individual child connection with God. So how do we, how do we show what he's like? I think sometimes it feels complicated. I've been thinking about the story of the woman at the well recently. And if you think she was the first evangelist to the Samaritans, all she said was, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? That's not the most profound, confident uh, preach I've ever heard. But they came out of the town and made their way forward. And later on we read, they said to the woman, this is the Samaritans, we no longer believe just because of what you have said, now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. That's what I want. Let me just be real about the things that are real to me. I've not got to think, okay, right, this is the seven steps that I need to say. I need to do this. I need to say this. I've got to do it in this way. We can kind of paralyze ourselves. But how is God real to you? And as I live out my true experience, and sometimes it's painful, I can believe that they will see God for themselves. And to see the faith of our children supersede our faith is, is a miracle. If I think back, how did God make himself known for, to me? I was 11 years old on a weekend away where God met with me for the first time. God broke into my life. Do I believe he can do the same for every one of our children within this community? Yeah, I believe he can. I believe he will. Hugh Osgood once said um, when he was adopting his, his son, the council were concerned that because he was a, a leader of a church that he was going to be coercive towards his, his, his child. And he was asked, do you want your child to have your faith? And Hugh replied, no, I want him to have his own faith. And that's what, what we've been talking about, isn't it? Since the summer, I don't know how many times I've shared this verse. No longer will they teach their neighbor 
or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. That's our desire for every one of us here. It's also our desire for our children. He's not saying there's not a place for teaching. The Bible talks about teaching. But there's a point where the penny will drop. This is what I want for my kids. So what is the wider role of the church and that, that extended family? Well, we, we provide parenting material. And if you saw from that video, we want to update those fantastic videos that we've used all around the world to emphasize some of these principles that God's taught us about parenting. And those things are, are, are helpful, but just a parenting course every once in a while, it's not quite what I think God's got for us. I think he wants to take us seriously at our promise. If you think, when, when we give thanks for children, all those little gurgling babies or vomiting babies, which is what my one did when he was up here, we made a promise that we would be a community that would support their, their upbringing and their connection with him. So I think God's got that role for us. I think I want to encourage us to start thinking, what, is, what does that look like in a practical sense to actually fulfill that promise of, of helping our children connect with him? I think we have a watchman role. If you remember the story of Samuel, the first time he hears God call him, he says, um, God calls him and he thinks it's Eli, who's, who's like an extended family member, calling his, his name. So he goes in, three times he goes into where Eli is. And this, Eli's the high priest. Now it takes three times for Eli to think, oh, maybe God's speaking to you. It's a little bit concerning if it takes a high priest three times to think that God's talking to someone. But anyway... We can all get to that point. And he, he, he does some key, key things, Eli. He helps the child identify God's voice. He guides them in how to interact with that voice. And then he takes time to unpack what that child heard. We can all be part of that with our children. Another watchman role would be Miriam. So we see in the story of Exodus 2, so they've, his, uh, Moses' mother has just put Moses in the basket and pushed him into the Nile. Now, the Nile is where the babies were being drowned under the orders of, of Pharaoh to try and stop the, the children of Israel expanding in number. So he was put in the very place of greatest danger but hidden among the bulrushes exactly where they knew that the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, would be walking and would find the child. And talk about being put into the lion's mouth. But yet that was how God had guided them. And isn't that the safest thing? We can go to extraordinary length to try and protect our children, but sometimes the safest place is to be in the lion's mouth. The safest place is always to be in God's will. But Miriam has a role where she's watching from a distance. I don't know if any of you have ever felt like you've been in that role where you're complete, you feel completely helpless. You can't get in and fix the situation. You can't protect from all these things. But yet God has placed you in a role to be a prayerful watchman. And I think that, that prayer role is something that I think God wants to, to raise in us, to be praying over our children, that they would meet with God, that his per perfect plan would unfold in their lives. Now, I'm not expecting all 300 of you to do this for every single child within the community. That would, that would freak my kids out if you all started to try to have that level of relationship and involvement. But there will be certain ones of you that would realize, yeah, I, I'm already part of a tight-knit community around a particular parent and a particular family. And I think God's going to inspire you today to think, hmm, 
is there something more I can be doing to help that parent in what God's called them to do? We have a, have a supporting role for our children. Sometimes it's about role modeling. And sometimes it's those small insignificant things. Imagine if you're just at someone's house for dinner. You've gone to see the parent, but the child is there as well. What do you think they're watching in the way that you interact, in the way that you manage yourself in those situations? Children are very observant. They pick up a lot more than they're able to articulate. They might even find a new way to look at something just by how you talk to them. You might be able to help demonstrate their value by taking an interest in them. Does God not listen close to our prayers? How do we demonstrate that? Just take an interest in what football team a child likes or how their day was, but to be genuinely curious, demonstrate something of God. Just saying, I see you're good at this, or I see this as a real interest in you, is all part of how we wrap around and support. The historian Tim Holland um, has gone on a, a journey. He was raised in a church. He turned his back on it. Um, but in his book, uh, Dominion, he talks about he's never been able to shake the impact that his faithful aunt has always had on him. And however much he struggled with some of the teachings that he'd heard in church or within Christianity, he could never shake the fact that he had witnessed genuine faith in his aunt. Many years ago, we had Prince come up and share his life story. And he talked about his grandmother and just the seed of faith that she sowed in him when he was a child, so that when he was even captured by the rebels and forced to do the atrocities, there was something that just didn't leave him. Could God be using us to sow those seed of faith that journey with our children when they get older, no matter what journey they end up going on? My parents talk about when Daniel got to 11 years old, and uh, Sue Griffin, who would have been Sue Little back then, um, called, called the house phone and asked to speak to Daniel. That would have been the first phone call that Daniel had ever got at 11 years old. It meant so much, not just to Daniel, but to my, to my parents. My, my kids benefit from, from the visits of Auntie Avril just popping round and she really couldn't care if me or Lucy were there. She came to play with the kids, and the kids absolutely know that. There's other roles that we can have in supporting. Where's Mike? Mike, come talk about... Um, with, with a particular parenting situation. Um, a few years prior to that, we'd, we'd done the parenting course, um, and so and the Richard and Lucy November had run it at that point, so I thought we'd give them, give them a call. And I think we were kind of expecting some, some kind of parenting advice, maybe, or you know, try these strategies and those kinds of things, which were all really helpful things. Um, but instead, they kind of surprised us a bit and really showed us some real love and care and kind of really stood with us and showed us a really good example in that. They said, oh, actually, can we kind of pop over and... and speak with you guys and pray with you about it, actually. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, actually, that sounds good. Um, so they came over and just really kind of, I suppose, stood with us, prayed with us, helped us hear God on it. Um, and as we prayed and as we spoke with them about it, it was much more about, okay, well, how are you guys doing? What, what's your perspective in this? Um, how, is, how is your um, children doing in all of this? And where, where are they at and where are you guys at and what's God got to say? in all of that and it completely shifted our perspective at that point in time from a, oh man this is a, this is a bit challenging and we're finding this quite difficult to wow god's got something both for our kids in this and and for us in this and it kind of unlocked and shifted the situation just from that point obviously praying about it and god just being involved and also then just demonstrating that love and care and just that perspective that just god is there in it with us with them uh, and just fully thoroughly involved in the in the whole thing 
So when you call on the, the parenting experts to give you the next strategy and they have nothing, but yet they can introduce you to the parent of all of us and just stand with you and pray with you. Sometimes we just need to have a safe place for parents to reflect and look at their vision and their strategy. During lockdown, right at the beginning of it, this little image um, was making the was circulating. So you got devil saying, ha ha, with COVID-19, I've closed down all your churches. And God saying, on the contrary, I just opened one in every home. And that really caught my imagination at the time. So I was thinking, I really want our homes to be a place, to be the primary place where our kids and our families as a unit together encounter and experience God. And it's not got to be in terms of hours of quiet time and Bible study together, but just in the reality of living life together. And we were, we were limited to doing our Zoom, um, our Zoom meetings. And at one point, uh, we asked Hannah, could you just check to see how are parents, particularly with young children, getting on in Zoom church time? And um, she did a little bit of research. And we discovered that there wasn't any single um, recommendation of doing things differently. Every parent said, well, do more of this. And the next parent said, do less of that. So we, we didn't really have any consensus on it. But one of the things that seemed to come out was that the, the end of lockdown had been announced by that point. There was a, a sense of relief from parents, like, once we can get back to normal, I can send my kids away to children's ministry, and that would be so much better. And um, I was concerned that it sounded like we were outsourcing our spiritual growth for our children. And it, it was at odds with what I saw that, that image to communicate. I completely understand that sentiment. But I felt that God's, God was bringing us a different message. And the same kind of that, that outsourcing, I think I hear that sometimes when I'm talking to some of our youth leaders, just this sense of responsibility of I've got to bring these young people into a relationship with God. And we can't do that. And really, we're part of the wraparound support to help the parents in what God's called them to do. And even for the parents, there's a limit to how much you can do. But as I was reflecting on this, I felt that God wanted to communicate three things to us. The first thing is God wants to remove our sense of guilt and failure as parents. And I think we inherit that as soon as a child is born. Just a sense of failure most of the time. Guilt, comparison, oh, we're not doing it as well as them, or they're able to do it so, so much better. I think there's often a big chunk of, of guilt. And God wants to lift that from us. What causes that guilt? Well, it's the reactions at 4.45 in the morning. It's, oh, I haven't told a Bible story recently. Or, oh, I missed my opportunity to lead my child to God in that situation. And so I see other parents doing so much better. And I fall into that kind of shame spiral. And then I try and overreach and force the spiritual activity. Oh, you want some more bread? Well, Jesus provides all bread. <laughs> then I flip it the other way. Oh, it's too pushy, right? Let, let me just take, take the foot off the pedal and just let them make their own way. Then sometimes when you've just been reacting a certain way, it's like, oh, I, I'd be a hypocrite to then talk about God in, in this setting. Sometimes life just feels so overwhelming that just... Keeping them alive feels like an, enough. God wants to lift that all from us because his burden is light. I think God wants to reveal to us how much he loves our kids and our families and how excited he is about the adventure he has for us. When I say he's written every day in his book, I really do believe it's a page turner. He is so excited 
about our family units more so than we are. And sometimes we would feel awkward about God looking in on our lives, but he doesn't feel like that. And I believe that God wants to give us a sight of this adventure that he has planned for us, that we will be so inspired as parents that we would want to lead the charge into the adventure. We would want to take on the responsibility. We don't want to outsource because we want to be part. We want to be front and center of all that God's got for us. And I think there's a role for our kids to take in this as well. Because our kids contribute to the adventure. Avril tells the story that um, one, one day there was a guy that turned up to see mum and dad. And he obviously must have looked like he was in a bit of a state. And everyone knew about this guy. He loved Mars bars. So one of us brought him into the kitchen where mum was cooking, pulled up a chair for him, went to the cupboard and took a Mars bar out and gave it to him. And it, it, when, when, when I was a child, now, I can't think who would have dared out of any of us to take a Mars bar out of the cupboard without mum's permission. You think it would be Nathan? Nathan would have had it himself. <laughs> we always had this kind of idea that you should never open anything new. Like you can open a new pack of anything in, in the house. So the way that Nathan used to do it, I discovered, if he, was, if he wanted a triple bar that came in a pack of five, he just ate all five. So there was... <laughs> Mum would never find a hot, an open packet. But sometimes we can be surprised at what our kids pick up and how they can express, because one of us would have been seeing how my parents worked with this guy. Gives you a reason for connecting with people. I'm getting to meet a lot of parents at Arthur's school because that, he, he has provided me an opportunity. Our kids can hear God. We've often heard stories about some of the profound things that our kids have heard. I don't know if anyone has ever been taught by their children how to respond and something about God's nature. Am I making space for this? Do I carry this expectation? So, we've got the role of the parents. We've got the role of the church. How do we work together? So, as a parent, is there someone that I'm willing to allow to be close enough when it hits the fan? Am I willing to be that vulnerable, to allow people to see me at my worst, where I can't kind of edit my photos. Are there people in your child's life who might also commit to watch over, over them, be another safe place for them to talk to? Do you ever share your dreams and aspirations or your concerns for your children with anyone that might be able to encourage you? And a big question is, how much are you willing to pay for all this to happen? So are you willing to tell your little story? I, I remember in my head that I'd asked you to do this, but I don't think I ever came back and asked. Are you happy to do it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so one of our children, uh, our older child, is, uh, struggles a lot with food and eating and has a lot of sensory issues. And at times, there's not even anything at home that we could think of that they might want to eat. So um, going out to eat can be really difficult. Um, sometimes, you know, a lot of people are really kind and they say, oh, what, what might they want to eat? And, you know, sometimes there's just nothing we can say that they could offer. So, um, but yeah, we just we've really chosen to uh, still go out, and even though it can be really hard and it could be awkward, and it, it's, it's yeah, sometimes it's a challenge. We just feel like it's really important to still share 
meals with people and still go out to people's houses and just um, kind of bond through that important kind of part of, of sharing life, even though it's a difficult thing. So it's a really serious question. Is it, how much are you willing to pay to have this level of shared life? If you just want it to be all run really smoothly, I don't think it's ever going to work. But the danger of, of that is you cut yourself and your children out of the opportunity for God to use the community that he's placed you in. So that's a real, real serious question for, for parents to consider. How about from the other side, as a member of this wider church community? I think there's an opportunity to ask God, give me that God-given curiosity that I'd actually want to know what's going on for that parent or for that child, that I'd come alongside them, that I'd say, God, surely you were here the whole time and I just wasn't aware of it. I want to find out. And I always loved the story with the burning bush that it was curiosity that brought Moses close to where the presence of God touched down. And, um, and I think as, as we allow that curiosity to, to, to come close, we will see something of God working in people's lives that we weren't aware of before. Another thing is ask yourself, where am I already overlapping lives with someone else? Maybe I'm serving alongside a young person in a setup team, or we're running the cameras together, or we're, we're already on children's ministry together. It's not necessarily about cutting out a whole new space of time. It might be that, but it might just be look around you. Look what opportunities are already there. Ask yourself, which parent or parents am I already friends with? Have they expressed a vision for their household that I could be part of, I could contribute to? And very important, we never want to cut across the divine role of the parents to set the tone. So you always want to be open and willing to be guided by where the parents are going. That doesn't mean that you can't ask the parents questions and explore if there's something that you feel is, is wrong, but you don't want to be working um, contrary to, to what's, what, what the parents are trying. Now, just to say, don't just put this down to children in children's ministry. I would include our young people right up to adulthood within this because we have ministries such as children's ministries, youth ministries, youth plus ministry, but there is a role for all of us. Let's not just uh, assume that's happening over there. Now, meetings and activities such as youth meetings are, are important and valuable but there's never any replacement for genuine, consistent care and relationship and interest. Now, how about this, this setting now, the corporate gathering? Because all that I've talked about doesn't, isn't, can't be confined within the corporate gathering, but these times are very significant. It's the only time in the week that we're all together, and that's a special time. Also, there's some children that will be here that aren't part of the community in any other way. So there's an opportunity to demonstrate what God is like for them, even during this two, three-hour slot that we're all together. Because we want children to be able to access what we do on a Sunday morning. So we are constantly looking for ideas, suggestions. How do we make this time more meaningful? And more importantly, how do we support parents in that process. Now, one of the things that we're looking to do, um, we are launching next week these, um, all right, uh, I've got a name. I've got two names now because I asked both Hannah and Sarah what they're called, and they've come with different things. So, uh, flip a coin. Right, they're called Kid, kid Connection Packs. 
okay? Because we want our kids to connect as part of what we're doing in the community, but we want them to connect with God. And so each week there'll be a pack like this that parents can, can use if you think it will be helpful to help your children access what's going on. Now, I won't take this one out and show it because I left it on the side ready to go and William opened it and started working on it. Um, so, William, did you, did you do this? Yeah, I put it back. <laughs> So, that will be available next week. We'll do a reminder for that as well next week. Um, what's our possible response to this? Well, I think there's response of parents, response for the wider community. And, oh, just put this in. Even if you're a parent of your own children, you might still be used by God to be part of the journey of someone else's children. Right, so the first thing I felt that God wanted to, wanted to offer us is an opportunity for guilt to be replaced with joy and excitement about what he's got for us. So if you feel a sense of guilt, a sense of failure, nothing's too hard for God. Bad habits can be broken. Relationships can be restored. The same God that can turn water into wine, turn things that is bland into something that's decadent, the same God that can feed 5,000, can multiply, whether it's our energy, our time, our resources. The same God that can put a baby Moses in the palace of the king that was seeking to kill him for his protection and his purpose. Nothing's too hard for God to turn around. He can turn all things for good. Another response of parents is, God, is there someone that I can invite into my family who can bear the burden with us? Now, for the wider community, who would God have you invest in? Who are you going to give yourself to? What action will you take today towards that? And asking God, give me a genuine curiosity. I want to be driven by a desire to know what you're up to in a, in a young person or a parent's life. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast by Lifeline Church. We hope this message has been an encouragement to you. We are a relational church with a passion to demonstrate God's love to one another and our surrounding community in real and practical ways. We believe that God has called us to have an impact on our families, our communities, and our nation. We'd love to connect further with you, so please do visit our website at lifelinechurch.co.uk, on Facebook, lifeline.church.uk, or Twitter at lifelineuk.